Hello everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the day 2 of KCD Chennai. Very happy to be here talking to you about how to build reliability in cloud native. I am Uma Mukhera, head of chaos engineering at uh, Onis. I am also co-creator and maintainer of uh, Litmus project, which is an incubating project at CNCF at the moment. Before we begin let's uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, where I work and what I do um Harness is a modern software delivery platform it has various features like continuous integration continuous deployment feature flags cloud cost management security test orchestration security service reliability management and of course uh, chaos engineering Litmus is an end-to-end -end chaos engineering platform. Uh, it's a complete framework for building chaos engineering capability for DevOps um, in your cloud native organization. So what are we talking about this morning? We're talking about how to grow in cloud native. Uh, many of us are moving to cloud native. Uh, we are well into cloud native. Um, but how do you make sure that you grow in cloud native very confidently without any hiccups and also efficiently uh, which means that you know you are spending the right amount of resources and uh, you're um, including the cost as well as you are getting the right reliability or returns uh, within uh, cloud native So to grow within cloud native uh, very efficiently and uh, confidently you need to have a reliability in cloud native. So we'll talk about uh, cloud native a little bit and then what is reliability then what it means uh, to have a reliability in cloud native which will help you grow within cloud native very confidently. So let's uh, do a quick recap on what is cloud native. So as we all know, uh, cloud native will usually have lots and lots of microservices. You're basically moving away from either bare metal or virtualized environments into containers where your focus is really the small amount of software and you're writing um, a good API around it and they can run anywhere, right? So eventually your application is broken up into multiple microservices and then in cloud native you are seeing these microservices are being shipped out very fast, right? That's one of the advantages of um, or benefits of uh, moving to cloud native, right? So your software ships fast and of course uh, these microservices are now run under um, on any cloud wherever there is Kubernetes uh, abstraction. Um, many of the cloud pro providers are providing Kubernetes abstraction layer or uh, Kubernetes service. So you can expect that your microservice runs uh, everywhere, um, all, almost all on clouds or on other enterprise um, boundaries wherever Kubernetes uh, distributions are being deployed. So this is in summary what a cloud native uh, is. So you have heterogeneous environment, you are uh, having multiple microservices containers which are being shipped out faster. And what's also new in cloud native compared to your legacy system is you will generally see more and more dynamism, right? So um, basically they are being shipped out faster, there are too many components. And also you have lots of uh, new personas or people uh, who are bringing in, um, you know, uh, new capabilities, uh, not like uh, legacy system capabilities. And, um, you know, these people are needed because you are bringing in new technologies, you are building uh, new pipelines uh, uh, for your software delivery and uh, operations and management and so on and so forth. Right. So eventually this is also leading to creation of uh, new personas in your software uh, delivery or management uh, lifecycle systems. For example, the, the concept of SRE is becoming a site reliability engineer is becoming more and more common nowadays. 
in any cloud native uh, system cloud native developers uh, or a class of uh, you know uh, new software developers uh, who have to assume that your software is configurable uh, declaratively and it can run anywhere it has to have a good api so you need to be using new set of tools um, to to make sure that you know all this are being satisfied so basically um, cloud native environment development ecosystems devops ecosystem is uh, definitely a bit different and we sometimes call this as cloud native devops right so that's that's also one thing to note about cloud native as you can see here there is a big change that is underway and we call it as uh, you know moving to cloud native and almost um, you see uh, product services uh, vendors um, you know participating in every area uh, to to make the journey of uh, cloud native moment uh, very very successful and so it's 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 happening and uh, cncf is leading um, the entire change from the front so that's about uh, cloud native let's also talk about uh, what is reliability before we talk about reliability in cloud native let's really touch upon uh, what do we uh, really mean when we say reliability so reliability is actually a kind of a perspective uh, everybody says that you know uh, we are reliable our products are reliable our services are reliable uh, but then why are we talking about um, reliability with such an importance reliability is a perspective it's always about how many nines do you have in your uh, service when you say uh, your service is reliable is it like four nines five nines six nines etc okay. so it's always measured as uh, you know a way of how many outages that you had in the last year or so right so when the outages are uh, increasing you are less reliable your reliability uh, you know decreases so how to actually uh, increase the reliability of your service is really by reducing the outages right so outages are uh, the point uh, to be noted here so why is reliability so relevant uh, now uh, in this modern uh, digital era is um, the digital services are growing very fast. Uh, we are of course uh, seeing a lot of uh, businesses moving to internet based traffic because of all this COVID. Uh, we have seen this digital transformation uh, you know, um, happening fast uh, already and the traffic is probably 10 times more than what uh, we had been seeing you know a few years earlier right the reliability is really important because there's so much of uh, you know, new traffic uh, coming on onto your digital system and uh, when things are happening uh, at such rate um, the outages if at all they happen uh, they're going to be very expensive as you can see some examples here right um, uh, how much ever you try outages are uh, kind of you know uh, a common thing uh, it, it only matters how often they happen or how rarely they happen but they do happen and when they happen there are going to be you know um, either financial uh, issues losses or reputational losses as we can see that you know the popular uh, products or services uh, that we do day in and day out uh, have gone under these outages and they of course are um, you know expensive to, uh, to the owner right so the impact of outages uh, can be of various types uh, they can be reputational uh, outages uh, just like you know we are seeing here on slack sometimes you know they can be uh, causing a huge financial losses as well right if you are under sla or if you're uh, you know a really critical business uh, that can um, you know uh, cause uh, huge losses for a bit of downtime as well and this is another example uh, wells fargo in 2019 and uh, of course what happens is um, also because of outages is uh, poor user experience uh, your users uh, nowadays dig digital age and they can get really frustrated sometimes because of these outages and bringing back 
um, bringing them back to your uh, service or business is going to be you know a huge challenge right so sometimes so impact of outages is very difficult uh, to quantify um, they are usually bigger than what you would uh, really assume both short term and long term right and uh, they are they are very important and now let's try to understand what causes these outages right um, uh, there's not really one thing that uh, uh, causes these outages but a set of things and uh, usually it's um, you know there can be application failures right so um, you have uh, something gets filled up um, because of uh, logging and um, something you know when you try it right uh, sometimes uh, things can uh, go bad and service timeout can happen these are categorized into application failures and uh, we have also seen uh, infrastructure failures uh, causing these outages right um, most of the times this infrastructure uh, there is redundancy but still you know um, you never know uh, whenever there is a failure in infrastructure um, things start to fail somewhere else right sometimes big infrastructure uh, failures like you know the whole region becoming unavailable uh, it's not very um, uh, common but they do uh, happen and can happen right and the other types of uh, failures uh, that can cause outages are uh, operational failures right so capacity issues you have not um, populated your service with enough capacity and then under high traffic things can um, you know go uh, very bad um, and you are not uh, scaling the way you are expected to scale under the, that um, um, that uh, conditions or that traffic and uh, whenever there is an incident happen how well you manage that incident you know are you recovering fast or is there an auto recovery for such a failure these are all you know part of operational uh, failures and then you know uh, a good incident management and monitoring is very important um, when you don't have very good uh, monitoring and uh, you know ops um, uh, monitoring systems that itself uh, could be a major factor that uh, causes a longer outage right so these are some of the generally observed things right? and if these are very um, the general reasons uh, why outages can happen let's talk about uh, in cloud native environment what can cause an outage right so before we go there uh, let's just remind ourselves here uh, the typical you know uh, nature of a cloud native stack it's a, it's a kind of a, a pyramid here where your app as a developer what you concentrate is really on the top of the pyramid and it's a cloud native app which really means that you know it's a container and then there are a bunch of uh, services that uh, your app requires to function, right? Uh, they can be, um, you know, the message bus, data bus basis, or the cloud native services, or Kubernetes itself. And then there is a uh, underlying big platform on which Kubernetes runs, right? So important thing to note here is a bunch of them are also microservices. It's not just your application or your container. Uh, the below layers uh, all the way down to Kubernetes, they're all of microservices uh, based, right? So in microservices, um, what can happen is, uh, especially on Kubernetes, um, a deletion of a pod um, is generally not seen as a, a real failure, right? And that can happen whenever uh, some pressure is put uh, and Kubernetes can just delete your pod and then relaunch it. Right, so uh, the architecture itself uh, is um, such, right? So this is actually a kind of a failure, but you know, this is your Kubernetes is designed to withstand that failure. And is your app or service designed to um, uh, withstand such a failure? And uh, will it be providing continuous service, uh, you know, as expected or not? Is a bigger question, right? So there are a lot of microservices, that's a summary. And then uh, microservice uh, based pods uh, can be deleted or such values are uh, not very uncommon. 
So other important thing to consider in Cloud Native is how fast they are getting shipped out. So the changes into your pyramid are happening 10 times uh, faster than they would usually happen in legacy system. So you have a continuous change of um, you know stack happening all the time in Cloud Native and pod deletes can happen um, anytime uh, in your stack including your application. Uh, these are apart from the regular infrastructure failures or operational failures or application failure, right? So the outages um, can happen more often if uh, you're not taking care of it proactively in Cloud Native. And that's why we're talking about reliability as a separate subject in Cloud Native today, right? So just to summarize, reliability in Cloud Native is more important because of two reasons. It's a combined effect of proliferation of microservices as well as uh, faster shipping of these microservices uh, coming into uh, deployment or production. So we talked about what is reliability and why is it so important in Cloud Native. And we also talked about uh, you know what uh, real Cloud Native environment looks like uh, when uh, you see with the lens of reliability. And now let's also talk about how can you plan to achieve this reliability in a systematic way, right? So most of the time, um, the systems are deployed with redundancy. Uh, there's no single point of failure, right? So if not two or three or four uh, physical systems or uh, you know um, replicas, you always have uh, this redundancy in mind uh, when services are deployed. But you know outages still happen because you know systems are very very complex, and they're continuously in a state of flux. Uh, it's very difficult to define the state of uh, system at a whole, uh, a complete system uh, at a given point of time. Right as the traffic increases, as the network traffic increases, mm -hmm. system uh, state changes and load. Uh, a lot of things can uh, be different from time to time. And then when something goes wrong, your redundancy comes into the picture the way I expect. Most of the time, yes, it works, but you know it may not be the case all the time, right? So that's the uh, criticality of service that we are talking about. So the problem with some of these approaches that uh, we are uh, seeing in uh, with respect to reliability is they're not proactively managed. Um, what it means is that most of the time they are reactive. Uh, when problems happen, you go and try to recover them, right? And um, they're not collaborative. You don't have systems in place uh, to collaborate a failure uh, and recovery, uh, failure recovery, basically. Um, and uh, you don't have uh, this failure testings um, that they do, they may be ad hoc in nature, they're not well integrated into your CACD systems, right? So what's the right approach to build reliability in Cloud Native? The right approach is what we call as take the chaos first approach in your DevOps, right? What is chaos first approach? Let's talk that. Chaos first approach is to introduce Chaos engineering is a tool to systematically build the culture of, um, you know, improving reliability into your DevOps, right? Um, reliability is uh, not one person's job. It is uh, everybody in everybody's job in DevOps. Uh, you need to have a certain um, predefined approach uh, while building the software, then while delivering the software, while deploying the software, and then while managing the software, right? So the entire DevOps need to be looking at chaos engineering as a tool that will help them um, to build systematic uh, improvements into the reliability and making sure that reliability is always there. So what is chaos engineering? Let's talk about that. Chaos engineering is the practice of um, breaking things on purpose. Before uh, they happen, you break things and then verify uh, that uh, there is no system weakness. Even if there is a system weakness, now you're going and uh, fixing it, right? 
So you start small, you start with small faults on a system uh, in various different layers, uh, to various different systems, and keep proactively introducing these faults, all right? Uh, introduce this fault, compare it with the result, with the expected behavior, which if it is same, then you're good. Uh, at least your system is uh, resilient at that time or against such failure. If it is not, then you have got uh, something to learn. And because you are introducing this failure, um, you are well prepared uh, to deal with uh, the outcome of uh, such an introduction of failure. And uh, you can either uh, reverse it quickly or automatically recover. Uh, it's always better uh, than you know a fault happening without your knowledge, right? So chaos engineering um, is is done always in a controlled environment um, and uh, you will have the ability to control the blast radius and uh, you're proactively verifying your system against uh, such faults uh, one by one so that's chaos engineering and chaos engineering is a, a practice uh, that is now uh, coming as a you know an effective tool in cloud native to improve reliability in all areas of DevOps, right? So in other words, uh, chaos engineering has to become a kind of a culture in DevOps and uh, you go and introduce chaos tests in your uh, development uh, CI pipelines or in your delivery uh, mechanisms in CD or in your ops uh, where you continuously validate uh, your SLOs, service level objectives against such failures and then you keep uh, creating some uh, random tests like game days and uh, even before you actually get into production you could be uh, doing a failure testing chaos testing you know very effectively um, before actually your code can go uh, into the production environment so if you approach the failure testing from all angles with uh, good tools then chaos engineering becomes very effective and it actually aids uh, you know retaining the reliability even when your systems are so dynamic and you know uh, and uh, running at high scale so who can use chaos engineering right uh, chaos engineering is uh, typically thought of it's a, a, a supporting practice or a tool for uh, sres or uh, operation systems but uh, it is now increasingly being used by both uh, you know QA teams as well as the developers, right? So developers are using um, chaos engineering practices uh, to test their microservices uh, code, uh, you know, in in various different environments uh, right at the development time. Similarly, QA teams uh, they will have their a uh, large. Uh, Test setups, and they can now test uh, against various failures uh, before actually qualifying uh, completely. Right. So, and of course, SREs uh, can actually uh, use chaos engineering to perform annual game days. And uh, once they're comfortable, they go to the automated game days, where um, you are basically introducing faults randomly, and then checking your system if it's reliable or not. So basically, uh, all personas can be involved in chaos engineering, and we are seeing that um, all these personas slowly taking chaos engineering as a as a common practice in their day to day DevOps job. All right. So let me talk a little bit about one such tool, the tool that uh, we work on. Uh, it's uh, Litmus Chaos. It's a complete uh, chaos engineering platform to practice end-to-end uh, uh, -end, uh, chaos. Um, uh, experiments uh, and uh, the post effects of the experiments and effectively manage uh, the entire chaos experience uh, on Kubernetes right so it is a CNCF project now and uh, it's been there in uh, use and development for about five years now uh, very stable uh, we have done more than 50 uh, enterprise uh, releases um, and uh, it's being used by uh, many enterprise users uh, and you can see that you know its growth is uh, increasing on a quarter by quarter basis so it's a very stable project uh, and uh, feature complete for your um, basic uh, chaos engineering needs uh, in cloud native right so uh, it has 
at the core um, uh, what we call as chaos center uh, which is a centralized platform where different personas can come and collaborate on chaos and that's what we call as chaos control plane and um, you have a bunch of uh, uh, chaos experiments that are stored in a public or uh, your own private chaos hubs um, where you use those experiments build your chaos workflows or scenarios or chaos tests that makes sense uh, for you uh, to your service or application and then you can launch those uh, chaos workflows or schedule them or execute them against uh, various different uh, you know uh, infrastructure or uh, systems so, such as kubernetes or various cloud platforms or bare metal uh, or um, uh, you know uh, your on-prem vmware etc etc that's that's how uh, litmus structures and in litmus as i just said um, your teams collaborate around chaos tests and they can be launched uh, in various ways um, right you can uh, send them as a trigger uh, to a certain event uh, or you can just schedule them uh, every uh, weekly or you can just uh, put them into your ci or cd pipelines um, the developers use uh, litmus chaos workflows as um, you know as a way they do the other uh, program executions using uh, kubectl so basically a developer can do a kubectl apply of a chaos workflow uh, wherever um, they want right so that gives uh, a bigger and effective capability to include this in various uh, cicd pipelines or in their unit tests um, or integration tests etc etc so at the end of um, so how developers really um, use litmus chaos um, and uh, introduce chaos uh, tests into their pipelines uh, this is how they do it so they log into chaos center they will have a bunch of uh, experiments available to them and uh, they can use those experiments and uh, create a new scenario to match their um, uh, application that they are writing and at the end of it, you will have a YAML file, uh, a declarative file that describes your chaos scenario. And you can push it into your uh, Git. And um, that's one part of it. And then you can come and uh, inject that or call that uh, file through kubectl into a pipeline. And when you do that, uh, full chaos execution happens. Um, the litmus uh, execution plane gets spun automatically chaos tests run and chaos results are pushed back into chaos center so the moment you introduce uh, this chaos stage into pipeline they get automatically run and you have your chaos analytics already available in chaos center and you can compare them over a period of time how my application uh, has been improving uh, or you know you can continuously verify that there is no actually new bug that you're introducing um before you merge your code uh, um, into your repository so another way that developers are using is through gitops um, uh, in your pre-production environment uh, your apps are getting upgraded and the moment uh, the apps are upgraded a certain test can be run so before your app or code goes into production uh, the pre-production environment uh, can actually um, verify the new functionality against uh, certain failures um, and those failures can be triggered uh, automatically without developers knowing it right so this is a capability that uh, will help developers uh, making sure that no new bug is introduced um, in a larger uh, at a larger uh, play as well as uh, they are verifying and their code before it actually uh, gets shipped against such uh, real-time failures. So where do you start is another question. Uh, there is no um, specific way to start chaos tests. Um, you can start in pipelines and move towards right, right pre-production production. Sometimes people start uh, in pre-production. You know if there is an SRE. Uh, that is interested in chaos engineering, uh, they will bring chaos engineering into that organization and then uh, start introducing uh, failures or automating those failures tests in uh, the CD and then CI pipelines. 
So we are seeing chaos engineering, a chaos tests being done uh, in all areas. There is no particular way um, in starting and progressing, uh, you know, later on. So this is how a good chaos maturity model looks like um, in reality, right? So you always start on basic infrastructure, introduce failures in infrastructure, and um, you verify your code or your service is reliable against such failures. And it could be uh, various combinations of failure even at the infrastructure. And slowly you will move up uh, introducing uh, failures uh, that are related to middle layer such as message queues or API servers and then go to your data services right or your databases and uh, finally you start writing chaos tests that are specific to your application right and all these things happen over a period of time uh, it could take uh, you know a few quarters to sometimes few years by the time that uh, you have a full-fledged uh, chaos engineering practice where um, uh, you have all sorts of uh, chaos experiments or chaos tests and they are fully automated into your DevOps practices. So chaos is not like a magic bullet. You have a good tool to start off with and it has to primarily become a culture. That is when uh, you have uh, a good way to measure reliability um, and you are measuring um, the choice of or chance of uh, not introducing new failures uh, into your software before they get shipped. So just to summarize uh, the benefits of chaos engineering uh, in your DevOps, um, introducing chaos engineering in your DevOps will lead to um, three major benefits. Um, first, uh, you will see the ability to introduce, um, you know, a failure quickly uh, it's called uh, mpta mean time to identify um, this is a common problem in most of the systems um, you know that a failure is happening but it's very difficult to reproduce when you have chaos engineering your developers are uh, well versed in the failure practices there are a bunch of uh, chaos tests that are already available so this new scenario can be uh, quickly uh, reconstructed Right, so your time to identify uh, a bug uh, or a scenario will greatly reduce, and because you are able to, uh, you are actually reproducing uh, these faults or introducing these faults all the time. Uh, your capability to recover uh, from a potential outage uh, will be very very high, and the recovery times will become slower. And because uh, you are now uh, going deep and debugging them, your development systems are also practicing chaos engineering, failures in general will reduce and that increases the distance between the failures or MTTM. So this is the overall uh, ROI from chaos engineering and that uh, when you decrease the time to fail, uh, you are basically reducing uh, the number of outages and then you are increasing the reliability. When you do this as a practice, uh, you are guaranteeing, um, you know, to your uh, customers that uh, the service is reliable. Uh, that's because you are already testing all the time against uh, uh, potential failures um, in, in various areas, right? So just to summarize, um, reliability uh, should be a DevOps focus in Cloud Native. And uh, introducing chaos engineering into uh, DevOps, uh, your DevOps, Cloud Native DevOps will result in high ROI. And uh, it yields uh, structural improvements. It's not a magic bullet. It yields structural improvements to your product and to your uh, DevOps practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, also your teams will be better because they are aware of the product working. Uh, whenever failures do happen, so they have debugged the system many, many times. Uh, whenever these failures are introduced and weaknesses are found, so you're basically having a much better engineering team that knows your product very, very well. Right. So the path to resilience is a kind of a, a structural ladder here uh, when you follow chaos engineering as a practice in DevOps. That's uh, mostly about uh, what I want to talk. Uh, right, and you can um, use Litmus, uh, the open source version um, uh, from GitHub. Uh, it's very easy to start. 
and you also have a freely available hosted version at uh, litmuschaos.cloud give it a try when you sign up you get um, uh, a control plane you can uh, connect your uh, target plane or execution plane or an agent and then start running chaos that's all i have uh, now i can take uh, some q and a uh, here in this session Thank you.